On behalf of the American Academy of Neurology and in collaboration with Neurology Today, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ann Tilton. Ann is a child neurologist by trade, and she's also the vice president of the American Academy of Neurology and sitting on our AAN board of directors. Uh, in her day job, she is a professor of neurology and pediatrics and section chair of child neurology at the LSU Science Center in New Orleans. And of course, she was also a former chair of the ABPN, lots of a former program director. You made it through alive. I barely did. Um, and you were also on the RRC. So you've, you've worn a lot of hats. Um, so I guess we can talk about, uh, you know, several things related to child neurology and COVID-19, but, uh, you know, whether it's education, administration, um, leadership, but I guess just the first thing, um, you know, what's, what's it been like to be a child neurologist during this pandemic, um, you know, with a new disease and vulnerable children out there, young children, babies, um, you know, teenagers um, with neurological diseases that may put them at risk. What's it been like for the last uh, few weeks? Well, I think it's totally new world for all of us. It was very different. And walking into it, we weren't sure how vulnerable children in general would be. And it seems that they are less so. Yeah. And we were obviously very happy about that. Um, but then again, there are the groups within that who have immune compromise uh, on steroids. And um, so we were very cautious about them. But it really looked like that uh, the majority of the patients who were seriously ill and ventilated were really going to be down with the adult programs. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, the initial data, so I have a four month old at home. So I was really um, tracking this pretty closely. And the initial study came out, you know, several weeks ago now where they looked at 11 infants between the age of one to 11 months. And, you know, two were hospitalized. The other, the other nine did fine at home and, you know, it didn't seem like that big of a deal. And then as the, some of the studies have come out, there was one 14 year old boy that passed away. There's been a few um, teenagers and, and mm -hmm. even children that have, that have, that have, uh, you know, been really affected here in the United States. But, but I agree, it's been, um, I think a little bit, um, I guess, reassuring um, that, that, that children are in some ways protected. Um, but I guess when it comes down to, you know, pediatric neurology, um, from neuromuscular diseases, you know, epilepsy, you know, is there really impact there? You know, something like, um, and I, I don't remember much about child neurology, I'm an Alzheimer's doctor, but, um, you know, Dravet syndrome, which is maybe fever responsive. Um, what, what about the individual um, child neurology syndromes, you know, uh, inborn errors of metabolism, I, I, can, I can name a few. How has it been hard for a child neurologist in, in terms of dealing with some of these rarer diseases and also these more common diseases as well? Yeah, I think what we really try to do is to do exactly what everyone's been told, isolate them, keep them away from things, recognizing that if there is a vulnerability, it's going to be in them. Right. And also recognizing, and I didn't mention it a minute ago, that children can be sort of a reservoir. And because they can be asymptomatic, even siblings and other people that, uh, and giving it to older people, that children, while they, for the most part, look good, could also be someone who brings in the disorder into the family. And, and then you have the child who is vulnerable. Um, also, we have certainly children's spinal muscular atrophy and those who are later in their courses of muscle diseases that have respiratory compromise, and, and that's a problem. And then the, those who become quite ill, even with febrile seizures, or they just tip over and, and have that. So again, trying to keep those, those children safe and um, away. Yep. And, you know, with children being out of school, um, and, you know, there's children that have, um, you know, more mild neurological diseases. And then, you know, there's other children that have pretty severe, um, you know, limitations. And, you know, whether it's day programs, whether it's a daycare situation, where, whether it's just, you know, some respite for the family that, that, that a child can be taken care of outside the home, um, or maybe they need help inside the home, but the, uh, the care attendant is not able to travel or not able yes. to, you know, is quarantine themselves, you know, with a stay at home order. Um, What's it been like for parents uh, to, you know, really realize, um, wow, I'm home, I'm home from work. I don't know how long this is for. It could be two more weeks, four more weeks. It could be 18 months, some of the, some of the report. It could open up, everything could be great, and then I'm back in the house for four more months if we have a spike. What's it been like for parents um, having to manage their children with neurological conditions by themselves? I mean, beginning with typical children, I think it's difficult. Yeah. Uh, 
schedules are disrupted, a lot of the other things are done, and, and obligations that you didn't have before, like homeschooling, are suddenly on you with all the stressors and pressures and maybe even financial burdens. And that begins a typical child. And then when you move them into the children who have particularly maybe uh, disruptive or harmful behaviors, then they are often really, really uh, bound by structure and bound by routine. And now that's straight up and, you know, falling apart. And so I think that that's a particularly vulnerable group. Take the autistic child that's uh, very much structure oriented and, and then they have, you know, these kind of special needs. And then the children with other special needs of the families get respite and now they aren't going to have the respite. So it's, it's a really tough time. And I think the American Academy of Neurology is sort of stepping up this very point through brain and life through blogs saying, let's talk about this. Let's get some resources out there. And the Child Neurology Foundation Association with the Child Neurology Society say, let's get some resources out there. And hopefully those will be available shortly for um, people through the AAN and they're already available otherwise, just to say, when you're not the only one out there. <laughs> There's a lot of people lot of going people. through this, trying to, trying to cope and teach and survive. Yeah. So I wanted to talk to you about neurological complications in uh, child neurology patients. And, you know, I talked to Sherry Cho, a video uh, went live uh, recently and, um, you know, the, the facts and, and, and uh, the, the unclear parts of, you know, true neurologic complications, you know, you have one case report, is that real? Do you need a case series? You know, so I guess when it comes to adults, it's hard enough to figure out, um, are there neurological complications? What are they? Do they exist, first of all? If they do exist, how common are they? What are the idiosyncrasies? You know, like anosmia, for example, is pretty yeah. commonly accepted now. It's a, it's, I think it's a pretty real thing. And, you know, I had a colleague actually did an MRI in a patient with anosmia for some other reason. And um, guess what? The olfactory bulb looked a little funny and maybe it was real, maybe it wasn't. So, when it comes to children, when the numbers are so much lower, um, how, how do you reconcile trying to figure out, um, like, can we figure out if there are neurological complications? What's the best way forward? Um, Sherry is leading a group of, there's almost uh, 50 um, neurocritical care docs uh, from all around the country and actually other, other specialties too within neurology to try to put together a, uh, you know, IRBs are, are, are mirrored and, and they're trying to put together a, a registry basically and study this collaboratively. Is there anything like that going on in child neurology? Is that even possible, um, you know, logistically? What, what do you think about that? Um, I think it is more complicated because of the, A, the rarity of the disorder that's symptomatic in that group. Mm -hmm. And then if someone has uh, an encephalopathy and COVID, then you start saying, okay, maybe they have the encephalopathy form. Certainly interested in the anosmia and, and knowing that other viruses, the herpes viruses and others enter in that way, or is it, you know, secondary in some other way. Mm -hmm. But um, I think I'm seeing case reports in general and you're absolutely right. A registry is by far and away the best. It's worked in stroke in childhood. It's worked, you know, probably in several other ways, um, muscle disease and things like that. Um, getting organized is often hard, but uh, acute flaccid myelitis, I think, comes to mind as the most recent one. And now there's a real push in a group getting together, trying to characterize it. This is so rapidly evolving and so fast that I have not seen anything like that so far, and, and it may be out there. Gotcha. Um, so I guess another question I had is related to the gender or the sex differences between and with COVID-19. And when it comes to sex differences, it seems like, and this is for pretty unclear reasons, and maybe, maybe there's you know, they're trying to figure it out. In, in men versus women, adults, it seems like men um, may have poorer outcomes and it, uh, they're not exactly sure. Is it because of comorbidities? Is it because of just something, you know, with the chromosomal thing, hormones, like no idea. Um, I, I read a report recently about children um, that maybe male children were more affected. Um, in, in pediatric neurology in general, um, this is, and this is hazy, this is not confirmed, this is, you know, you know uh, anecdotes. Um, in child neurology and, and, and infectious diseases, do you have any, um, I don't know, um, gestalt here or any uh, preconceived notions or is it just kind of like, we, we don't know, we should probably wait till more data, it's hard to say. About it specifically in COVID, you're yeah. talking about? Yeah. Uh, 
again, we've had like four or five patients, and as it turns out, the majority were male. But I don't know if that was circumstance because of the numbers. Right. You know, they're just, again, so low, and that registry is going to be required. Yeah. It's, it is interesting that it looks like males are higher in several other things we do, everything from ADHD to, you know, of course, head injury because of activity level. Um, but I don't have anything on the COVID specifically, and I think that's going to come out. Maybe China has more on that if, because mm-hmm. they're going to have the numbers in Spain, unfortunately, and France and all those countries. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's hard, it's hard to get too excited about some of this stuff because you have to just, you know, take things with a grain of salt and you look at the numbers. Um, but but I, I, I think and I hope that as the numbers grow, and, and I agree, as the studies start coming out from Italy, um, I think, you know, as, as, as the data expands, and especially in Europe, if they can have some collaborations, um, I, I hope that we'll get a little bit of clearer data. Um, you know, we were, we were talking earlier, uh, uh, just kind of offline before we started the video, that you have um, uh, some kids that are living in France. Yes. What's, what's that been? I mean, uh, I, I'm sure it's been hard for you as a parent. I'm sure it's also been hard for them. But what's that been like? Things are, things are really tough in France. They were. They uh, very quickly sheltered in place. Yeah. And I was saying, come on home, come on home. And, you know, and about that time they were cutting flights. They were like, oh, no, we're three weeks ahead of you. Yeah. <laughs> we're a month or more ahead of you. And, and yeah. it was really unclear. Now they've, they've canceled everything. Yeah. It was interesting because they haven't done, they may have done this in some places in the U.S., but mm-hmm. early on when my son's a big runner yeah. and he had to have papers with him to go to the grocery store or to run and could right. be stopped. Right. And then they stopped them within a kilometer of their house and they could not run or be with anyone else. They had to be by themselves or within a kilometer of their house or they got, and he got stopped. Wow. And was like, I'm, I'm you know, I'm within a kilometer. Right. So, um, wow. that, I mean, they have really, really dampened it down. One, one's in Paris, the other two in Lyon. Uh, and same things there, yeah. same things. They've shut down the schools. They've shut down everything. And uh, yeah. so virtual, lots of virtual like we're lots doing. Of, yeah, exactly. And then I guess one more question. Um, uh, so uh, New Orleans, um, yes. you know, it's kind of like, uh, it was, so New York City was, I mean, New York City is still tough. Um, you know, we're, 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 I think, I hope uh, within a week or so after the peak, um, Let's hope. I, I just just hard to know when things are going to go up and down and waves and crests and that kind of thing. Um, what's it been like be, being in New Orleans? I mean, um, you know, Mardi Gras um, may have had something to do. It's like you know, in pot retrospect, and you know, we don't we don't want to think about that kind of stuff right now. But what's it been like? You know, I, the, the 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 horror stories and the worry was there, um, especially people with you know uh, certain medical comorbidities, hypertension, obesity. Um, smoking, things like that. Um, how have things been going in New Orleans? Um, I think we were planning for the worst there and, and maybe things didn't exactly hit to, to that, that degree. How have things been going? Well, they did. They anticipated a great deal, opened the convention center, set up areas um, in anticipation, seeing what was going on elsewhere. Luckily, luckily they haven't had to go into that at this point, to my knowledge. I'm my children's hospital is freestanding. And then we are part of a bigger system that has like three or four adult hospitals that are totally separate from us. Mm-hmm. So several things happened. We re, what would be the word, uh, positioned, repurposed, re, whatever, you know, the emergency room peds combo people got pulled out to the adult hospitals and, and those people reassigned. Right. Neurology got pulled out um, and, and those because of the bigger burden that was hitting the adult hospitals, but they were able to continue um, working with them. The plateau, we get a report, we were getting it every day of how many patients were in the system and what was going on. And we leveled out and we're starting to level now. And I think there's no doubt that a lot of people came into the city at Mardi Gras and I was telling you earlier, again, offline, yeah. that two of my faculty had these horrible, horrible flu-like illnesses, even we call it Lune de Gras, which is Monday before Mardi Gras, mm-hmm. and had already gotten sick. Mm-hmm. And one of them's husband was sick and then passed through. And then the COVID came. Mm-hmm. So they're probably, and maybe there's some antibody yeah. uh, back there um, of yeah. people who, 
who did have it. None of my group, except for right. one nurse, and she's back. And right. um, so we're good. Good, good. Well, Anne, thanks so much. Um, I, I, uh, I really appreciate you joining us. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think we're going to learn. A, we have a lot to learn uh, when it comes to COVID-19 and children, and especially in, in child neurology. Um, but I, I, it's, it's, it's reassuring that we haven't seen um, terrible outcomes just yet. You know, I think, I think one of the things that I'm really looking forward, well, um, I'm interested in, I guess I would say, I don't know what the right wording is, but, um, you know, pregnancy, you know, women yes. in the, the third trimester, is, is that, is, I read one report about being asymptomatic mostly, but then what about the babies? Um, you know, my niece yeah. is pregnant. She's going to give birth any day now. What, what does that mean? Um, you know, breastfeeding and, and breastfeeding, the, the breast milk should have the antibodies, but it shouldn't shed the virus. Okay, well, that sounds good. But breastfeeding with the baby there and the, so th there's a lot of unknowns. Um, but I don't know that, I don't know when we're going to figure this stuff out, but I just hope and pray that, um, you know, there aren't neurological complications from COVID in the infancy, post, uh, you know, pre-term, pre post-term, um, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm, I hope that we're not going to see stuff like that. Any, any feeling about that or too early to tell? Well, the things I'm hearing, okay, mm -hmm. you know, uh, which means in my experience, there's yeah. one at least. You know? yeah, right. <laughs> but uh, they're separating the mothers that are symptomatic. Yeah. They're doing C-sections, pulling the babies, keeping them completely separate. Yeah. And so trying to avoid that. Now, what that means, how long... And, and such is another issue. And can you be asymptomatic? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but there is concern for the newborns. And I think yeah. any question, they're going to be separated as well. Yeah. So hopefully third trimester is apparently the more worrisome. But Yeah. Confusing times. Tough times. Very. Well, and thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. And uh, for those watching, if you're interested and have more questions, you can shoot us an email at elearning at an.com and we'll try to cover your topic. Cool. Thanks so much. Stay thank safe. you.